1991, Soviet communist leaders declared democracy had arrived and the world breathed a sigh of relief. But although the statue of the founder of the KGB was taken down and the people celebrated, the KGB, which had held the evil empire together, did not go down with it. You believe that Soviet Union is the, the, the soul? Soviet Union e exists uh, now. These structures in Moscow exist. And amid the wreckage of past KGB campaigns, at the edge of the empire today, there's a familiar pattern. The principle of ruling any empire is divide and rule. If you look at the map of the Soviet Union, you will see numerous enclaves kind of time bombs planted all over the country. This is South Ossetia, a tiny enclave within the Republic of Georgia. When Georgia sought independence from Russia, Ossetia wanted it from Georgia, and the bomb went off. Well, my wife's a session, but there are many Georgian villages in this area. The sessions wanted to make them part of their republic. That's how it all started. It's a helicopter. They're checking our position. Then in half an hour, they will start to shell us. Georgia is a kind of the model, simply to show people, if you divide Georgia from Russia, you came to a kind of dead end. Moscow bound its empire to the center with tensions built into the republics. Popular movements for democracy upset a balance of fear and frustration controlled by the party and the KGB. With perestroika and the end of communism, a pattern emerged. Republics who put non-communists in power or refused to sign up for the new community of independent states found violence exploding underneath them. In the strategic North Caucasus region, giving access to the south between the Caspian and the Black Sea, the Soviets left a minefield of enclaves and disputed areas. Rebels against Moscow found themselves fighting their neighbors. Russia has fought for centuries to control these mountains. Here in the village of Haibach, the KGB burnt 700 people alive when they fell behind on the march to deportation in Siberia. Entire Caucasian peoples were deported, others relocated in a bid to pacify the region. And under perestroika and democratic leadership, the hopes of the peoples under Russian domination are still being manipulated. Some people known to have KGB connections, to say the least, are now creating their own nationalist parties. When the trend to nationalism became obvious, they thought it would be better to create their own parties in order to control them. They formed military groups in the same way, and more importantly, developed ways to get weapons to certain groups. In Georgia, under Gorbachev, Soviet troops attacked a peaceful demonstration, killing 20 people with clubs and sharpened spades. A popular movement for independence became unstoppable. A lifelong dissident and veteran of mental asylums and prisons under Georgian communist leader Edward Chevardnadze was its leader. We had independent state, constitutional government, our constitution, and uh, this state exists the Yuri until today. Gamsahurdia was uncompromising. He demanded Georgia's total independence and the removal of all foreign troops. In three successive elections, he and his supporters won more than 86% of the vote against a wide field. But divisions quickly appeared. Within three months, armed protesters took to the streets. 
Some were disaffected nationalists, others members of Georgia's powerful underworld, others again former communists or members of the former privileged elites. They occupied the main street and the TV station, declaring the new president was a dictator. The world's press repeated the story and the inexperienced president was quickly isolated. things came to a head, Zviadgam Sahurdia, holed up in the National Palace, was no match for the firepower that these groups quickly produced from former Soviet arsenals. Eighteen months after their sweeping election victory, 73 members of Georgia's deposed parliament braved threats to meet again in Gamsahurdia's place of exile. It was in the neighboring Republic of Chechnya engaged in its own defiant stand against Moscow. They voted to condemn the coup as a maneuver inspired by Moscow. Gamsahurdia was defiant. We should not be afraid of terror and violence put into practice by the empire and its puppet government. <laughs> I wish you the best of luck in your difficult struggle. He said that the West was now in alliance with Moscow. We asked MPs if the president had been dictatorial as reported. He was uh, duly and legally elected by the majority of the people. He was rather too mild and uh, too soft. He was no dictator, he was uh, the greatest democrat I ever know. Representatives of nationalist groups from all over the Caucasus came to offer support. The MPs reaffirmed their commitment to peaceful struggle for return to power. Without war, without forces, only parliamentary way, only political methods of struggle, only political. As we spoke, former Georgian communist leader and interior police general Edward Chevardnadze returned to Tbilisi to take power at the invitation of the coup leaders. In the West, he has a great reputation as a peacemaker. It's a uh, pity that he has a great reputation in the West. Uh, his reputation in Georgia is uh, contrary different. Uh, he is a member of uh, communist mafia. He is uh, one of the organizers of total uh, corruption system in Georgia. He was an organizer of uh, uh, repressions of dissidents. And uh, uh, Georgian people uh, th think about him, that he is a bloody murderer of Georgian people. These protesters remember Gorbachev's foreign minister as the ambitious leader of one of the most corrupt local party organizations in the Soviet Union. This is some of the evidence against him. More than 10,000 letters written to every law enforcement institution in the Soviet Union by one man whose life was destroyed, he says, by Edward Chevardnadze and his close circle of top communists. In many factories, the bread was prepared from rotten animal fodder. They put poison, acid into juices. Forty children died as a result in the Altai region. There is a former prosecutor of the Republic who uncovered this whole business. He was sacked. And this is the former chairman of the Council of Ministers. They got rid of him too. He used to say that all these people should be put into prison instead of awarded medals. But the people who helped me uncover these things were all killed. Shevardnadze personally killed hundreds of people. Yasha complained even to Gorbachev. He sent my complaints back to Shevardnadze, imagine, to the criminal himself. And Yasha himself was arrested and tortured to make him retract his evidence. That apparatus they used on me, I don't know how to describe it. There is one instrument that looks like a hula hoop for the head, and they squeeze your whole head with it. 
Every day they tortured me, day and night, day and night. Take a look at the result. They were trying to force me to sign letters and false statements. They were constantly torturing me. There is not a fascist in the whole world, not even a Hitler, who could come up with such horrible tortures. And instead of being punished, he was awarded with medals and constantly promoted. He's a fascist. Not even a German could have done this. Shevard Nazi is a pig. Pig. What else can I say? A pig. Shevard Nazi is a fox. A fox. A fox. Russian news said Shevard Nazi had come to stabilize the situation. But prominent amongst those who invited him back was the militia leader, Jabba Yoseliani, a man who'd spent more than half his adult life in jail for repeated armed robbery. These are his followers, members of the Mkhedrioni, or horsemen. They describe themselves as an armed charity group. They have been armed since communist times, when they say they bought their weapons from Soviet units. The Soviet unit's arms is protected by special unit of the KGB, which called Osobist. Physical access to the uh, private personal arms in the Soviet Union was absolutely in the hand of the KGB. Yasman says the Hedrioni's first weapons came from a territorial army unit known as DOSAV, controlled by the local KGB. The Georgian KGB went underground when Gamsakhurdia came to power. They immediately published a statement that they are going to be loyal, absolutely loyal to popularly elected power. In fact, they are not. They're starting to spread uh, arms among the uh, different splitting groups. The fighting here in Zugdidi erupted months after the coup, in reaction to the criminal behavior of the Hedrioni and the military put in charge by the new leadership. Shevard Nazi's bandits came. They wrecked my house and held my grandchildren at gunpoint. They forced me to get a ransom of two million rubles to free them. We were holding a meeting when the National Guard and the Hedrioni arrived by bus. Without warning, they started shooting people. This man was shot dead. He has five children. The local leadership was outgunned and outmanned. They are asking for help, but for the moment we cannot do anything. If we do, there will be more bloodshed. I can't bring back my daughter, but you, whoever you are, just do not destroy Georgia. I don't care who it is. Gamsakordia or whoever, but let the people choose a leader and then leave him alone. Please do not destroy everything by leaving it to bandits. <laughs> this woman's son was shot dead in front of her as they talked on the street. It was this girl's brother. I'll get a machine gun. I'll buy one from the Russians. They'll sell me anything. The people of Zugdidi expelled the Hedrioni in a night of fighting. Officers sent to negotiate were accosted by outraged citizens. Come, see the school now. See what your Mehedrioni and militia have done. What did they want from school children, from their physics and chemistry classrooms? Who are you people? Who? This is the school where the horsemen were garrisoned for just two weeks. They used the books to burn for fuel and the corridors to drink in. For the children themselves, the building is now useless.
they return only to join in the looting. In the capital, Tbilisi, the ruins of Mr. Gamsahurdia's national palace are slowly being rebuilt. But on the 12th floor of the Ajara Hotel, a new ruin is being produced. This is home for one group of Hedrioni. Hey, zombie! Ah! Everyone else has abandoned the 12th floor after repeated robberies. There are bullet holes in the walls and in the guests who stay for free. The Hedrioni are volunteers. Arrangements are informal. Some stay at home and keep hand grenades in the ashtrays and guns wherever. And when they go to war, they borrow a car, usually from whoever is passing. Where did you get this car? It's my brother's car. Your brother? It's my brother who gave me the keys for this car. No, I say it's my brother's car. That's what I'm telling you. He gave it to me. I don't understand. How did you get it? And where are you taking it? Does my brother know about this? Of course. What do you think I am? A degenerate? If you want, go ahead. Take the key. I don't understand. I want everybody to get out of my car. The car we'd borrowed belonged to the brother of a policeman who happened to be on duty at our first checkpoint. Zombie was arrested, but immediately released by the local KGB. They offered him a job that same week. You want a glass? This is Sergo. He's influential. I can break into any one of these stores and get you a glass. He's Java Yoseliani's bodyguard and feared as a killer. I could stop this car right in the middle of the road. Watch this, right in the middle. After curfew hour, the idea of a member of Yoseliani's Georgian Rescue Corps is worth a thousand words. It's okay, officer. I'm drunk and my friend's drunk too. Misha. Misha, do you want to ask these guys any questions? Uh, why? Just because. Georgi Gepfendashvili, patrol commander. Hey, uh, wouldn't it be interesting to follow somebody and uh, set up our own checkpoint? In the casino of the hotel where our Hedrioni are based, the Latvian dealers have been robbed. They say that uh, these robbers were uh, those are people living in a hotel. And what do they call these people? Uh, no, Hedrioni. We went to a party with the horsemen. When Zviad Gamsakhurdia became president, well, he called himself a president. But we didn't recognize him, of course. He put 80 of our friends, together with Jabo Yasiliani, in jail. Then intelligentsia helped us. Then there was a split between the government and military forces. This is me during the war, and uh, this is my friend Sandrik. You can't imagine. This kid was blown apart by dynamite. Nothing was left of him, not even his shirt. Just a little scrap of cloth. With the young horsemen, weapon skills are learnt early. We just stay in our rooms. There's nothing we can do. Security in the casino is in the care of a former major in the KGB. He asked us in Chinese to help him look for a job. I am ready to work for any foreign secret service. We asked him about the horsemen. The Hedrioni are keeping the peace here. Once there is peace in Georgia, 
The head Brioni will be dissolved. From the earliest days of the coup, the peaceful supporters of the president learned to fear the horseman's idea of peacemaking. The evening before Yusilani issued an order to shoot at the demonstrators, we did not believe they would shoot unarmed people, shoot their own people. We just couldn't imagine it. You terrorists in the opposition, your intimidation has failed. You have failed to frighten the people here because the people are brave. Her words were to be put to the test. This was the first of as many as 50 attacks by the horsemen and related groups supporting the new regime on unarmed meetings protesting the overthrow of President Gamsahurdia. Seven people were shot dead at this meeting, 28 wounded. Eighteen-year-old Gia Rechviashvili was one of the dead. He didn't even have a chance to fall in love. His last words were... <laughs> Mama, I'd like so much to see justice triumph. Now he's not alive. It's very hard for us. Will we ever see the end of this? Every day we see the same things. If only that was the last day of violence and terror. If only every day that passes there were not more and more grieving women like me. Maybe somehow we could forgive them. But they keep on terrorizing us right up until today. We approached Mr. Shevardnadze to ask him why his closest associates were murdering people in the streets. Why is it that we have at least 50 names of people who've been killed at meetings and some 200 more wounded at peaceful meetings in the last five or six months protesting the overthrow of their government? Uh. Such statistics do not exist, that people have been killed at meetings. There are no such facts. This does not happen. I don't know who is giving you such information. I was at a meeting on May 18th. When they broke it up, they came with clubs and with armored cars, with police marked on the side. Mr. Shevardnadze's calm denial of the appalling facts was matched by his cynical explanation. We have a curfew. Just as in any democratic country, there is a certain order imposed, which must be respected by all citizens. Because certain groups don't respect this law, conflicts arise. But these conflicts were cold-blooded attacks on unarmed protesters carried out by Mr. Shevardnadze's own supporters. They took place through January, February and March when Mr. Shevardnadze returned from Moscow 
and there were more in April and May. Then clubs and rifle butts and cars began to be used to mow people down. And Western democracies, which had withheld recognition from Mr. Gamsahurdia's regime, accusing it of human rights violations, now granted warm relations to this one. Western democracies know all about what's happening here. But they turn a blind eye to the junta's atrocities. Yesterday, James Baker, the so-called father of democracy, arrived in Georgia to cozy up to the junta instead of condemning its actions. And Western reporters, too, were silent about what was happening, although information was not so difficult to find. Warning. All unauthorized rallies will be dispersed. Anybody who shows resistance will get a bullet. Signed, Jaba Yoselyani, deputy chairman of the Georgian State Council. That's one of those junta's leaders. Such individuals would disgrace any nation. Yoselyani shames not only Georgia, but the West as well, for supporting such a criminal. We asked Mr. Yoselyani why his men would not permit peaceful protest meetings. These are not meetings. These are provocations. They don't have any political demands. They say all sorts of rubbish, such as return our legitimate government. We love Gamsahuria. Or return Gamsahuria to us. These are their slogans. We asked Mr. Shevardnadze if his deputy was a Democrat. He said he had written plays and studied for a doctorate, apart from his time in prison. What are we supposed to do? Always bring up the mistakes of someone's childhood? I think this is not in the spirit of humanism. I have other views about a person and about his place in society and in politics. My question is, is Mr. Jabba Yoseliani a Democrat? You better ask him this question. We work well together in the interests of building a democratic society. It's not the complete list of persons we know about were shot down during the peaceful rallies. 47 persons killed during the peaceful rallies. Three cases we checked from this opposition list were confirmed by witnesses or relatives. Afterwards, 30 more names were added. Most were shot or beaten to death at rallies. Some were run over by armored cars. Half a dozen found dead after police interrogation or murdered in their homes were also included. Then came those arrested or wounded at meetings. The visit of James Baker was another chance to see how the regime of his old friend from Soviet days treated protesters. In his honor, rallies had been specifically permitted on this day, and some way off from the official celebration, protesters gathered. Many were women, some children. Gunmen in the vicinity passed unnoticed by the distinguished visitor enjoying the show. Cars drove into the protest rally and men in plain clothes pulled pistols and clubs from their belts and set about beating the demonstrators. Caught up in the melee, we recognized a friend. He was one of the horsemen. There was a young woman screaming as she tried to defend her child from the blows. At 
At this point, the armed men beating the demonstrators grabbed our camera and the serious shooting began. They were beating her child. She was shrieking. It was a terrible cry, you know, I heard. And she was defending her kid, but still they were beating then after that woman, after the child. And nobody could protect them because the guy who was beating them he was with an automatic gun. After Mr. Gasher's and Mr. Baker's visits here in Georgia, the, the public view here in Georgia is absolutely averted from the West. It is the single and simple result of this, I, well, I cannot even name those visits. It was, it was very ugly, it was shameless. Just in a few yards from the place where Mr. Baker was making speech, I can now even imitate him if he want me to. And then, then now when the democratic process are underway here in Georgia, and in a few yards, the demonstration of the supporters of legal government was severely broken up. Was beaten? Not only beaten, but it was shooting in the ear, shooting. But there was absolutely no guarantee that they won't kill anybody because uh, on every demonstration, on every breaking up, they killed one, three, or five persons. Just uh, the May 10, they beat in to death the old woman of 64. Or the May 18, yes, on the day of arrival of uh, the European community observers, the young boy of 15, Horava is his name. He was killed, beaten to death also. News of these events was published neither abroad nor in Georgia. As in communist times, articles not to the government taste are censored and replaced by innocuous photos. This one documented the KGB background of a member of Mr. Shevardnadze's state council. Later, this, like all other dissident newspapers in Georgia, was closed, and its editor has suffered worse at the hands of the new regime. His son was arrested by police and interrogated. He had visited Gamsa Hurdia in the basement of the National Palace when it was under attack, and they wanted him to testify that he had seen torture of prisoners there. In his written testimony, he said that he had not seen anything like that. My son was just a painter who had been in the palace bunker when Gamsa Kurdia was besieged two months before. He went to draw those people who were facing death. After the police arrested him, nobody saw him again alive. Early next morning, he was found dead. Members of the deposed parliament had been warned by Mr. Yossiliani not to hold their meeting in exile. Shortly after we were back from the Grozny session, some nine or ten deputies have been arrested by the police, and three of them were badly tortured in the prison. They just simply put the bottle up their anus. Professor Tengiz Kikacheishvili is the chairman of a group of academics and journalists in opposition to the new regime. The police wanted one of the MPs to testify that the professor was the leader of an armed gang. Deputy Vanot Rashvili was tortured to make him sign the paper. They used a recording of his daughter crying and he went into shock because of this and other psychological terrors they put him through. Does Mr. Shevardnadze assure us that there are no political arrests of any description here in Georgia? Not one political arrest. Not one. Marika Abaishvili is a newspaper editor fired by the new regime. Uh, we were imprisoned for attending the meeting, political meeting. And we are qualified as administrative prisoner. So uh, we are a kind of uh, hooligans. This man is afraid to show his face. He was shot by Hedrioni gunman in his home late at night. His crime? He has a brother in the deposed parliament. The neighbor's child was killed? Mm, wounded. 
Where? In the face. But they... He will not let us film him? No, because they are afraid. And they don't want to say about it. This lady has many friends active in the former president's cause. Do you know that Mr. Shevardnadze says there is freedom here for political action? Oh, no. <laughs> no, because um, many of my friends oh, were in prisons. We asked the professor if his committee believed in violent resistance. This is absolutely excluded. Absolutely. Our struggle is a peaceful one and a just one. That's what I and tens of thousands of other people believe. Others who believed like the professor were holed up in the western city of Zubdidi. This was now the center of resistance to the armed takeover by Mr. Shevardnadze's regime. The city was cut off, surrounded by vastly superior forces. I was the only foreigner inside. Nobody spoke a word of English. The attack was imminent. I was against it, goddammit. The Russians did it to make us fight with each other instead of with them. During the tempestuous negotiations, Kobalia fired a bullet through the ceiling and another through the floor. I filmed without understanding one of the torrent of words. The ordinary people of Zugdidi remained loyal to their legal president, Gamsahurdia, and their feelings were stronger than their motley band of fighters who had expelled the Putschist forces. When a delegation of politicians supporting Mr. Shevardnadze arrived to join the military negotiations, they found themselves cornered, assailed by a hail of outrage from the citizens who had suffered weeks of robbery, murder, and abuse. kill him because I'm a woman. They're threatening me. What do they want from me? They already killed my child and now they're threatening me. Can anybody help? Here in Zugdidi, do you see a single family which respects you? People don't want you here. 20 people were killed in the city. How many were killed in Tbilisi? And the people who did it were dressed in uniforms just like yours. Minimum 15 to 20,000 Georgians will die if we can't agree. As negotiations stretched on into the night, it seemed that Georgian Brotherhood might prevail. But to fuel the conflict, lies appeared to have been deliberately spread. In the prison, captured pro Shevardnadze soldiers told us their commanders had told them they were going to Zubdidi to fight Muslim foreigners who had invaded from hundreds of miles away. It seemed they had believed it. This is part of a pan-Islamic political plot. One element, pan-Islam political. It was disinformation. We were told that the whole Kutaisi battalion was killed by Chechens. That is why we came here. We thought the Chechens were here. We were told that only four people survived from the whole battalion. The story was also put out on government TV. Whether it was mentioned at the negotiations by Mr. Shevardnadze's political delegation, we don't know. Hey, get rid of the camera. In fact, it was completely untrue. There were no foreigners, only angry citizens rebelling in Zugdidi. But in this way, the military bypassed their demands for justice and respect for political rights. 
After a week of tense confrontation, an agreement to disengage was signed. Despite thousands of provocations, we have been able to come to an agreement. I think this is one example of the Georgian people's common sense. We have agreed to the following. There were nationalists on both sides of the table, and they had not always been so divided. First of all, when we have a national movement in Georgia, it was a strictly anti-communist. The address of their unhappiness and unsatisfaction was absolutely unmistakable. Communist Party and Moscow. And uh, Georgian people was quite uh, united about this goal. So the task of KGB was first of all to split it. Secondly, to undermine the nature of sympathy which uh, people in the other parts of the Soviet Union, and especially in the West, can have to such a movement. You can do this only to change the image of this, to show uh, that they are uh, not Democrats, they say nationalists or fascists, and to show uh, that real Democrats are Russians in Moscow. 36 accessions died in this massacre in May 1992. Massacres like this have played a key role in the Georgian story. Earlier killings discredited President Gamsahodia's regime in 1991. The Georgian independence movement itself took off after a massacre in 1989 conducted by Russian troops on Georgian demonstrators. KGB General Philip Bobkov took over power in Georgia to deal with the crisis. General Bobkov had a theory. He said that we are on a stage of the catastrophe, but catastrophe, it can be directed. Take the, the first horse, which are leading the herd, and to direct its way. In Georgia, the catastrophe of a clear-cut independence under a hostile leadership was averted for Russia. In the nose. The movement, which had been the most powerful and united in the Soviet Union, became splintered and confused, directing its energy into bitter separatist wars. They want me to cut off the supply lines, but I'm not going to risk my neck. These wars, in turn, brought Moscow back into the equation. Here, on the accession front, it's on its way back in its traditional role as an arbitrator, a weapon supplier, and soon a peacekeeper. The accessions have long been Moscow's closest allies in the Caucasus area, but it is an alliance of necessity because they too have been divided by the empire. The Soviets placed North Ossetia in Russia and South Ossetia in Georgia. For Ossetians to be free, they would need to take on both nations. Hey, let's run. Georgians now are telling stories about this tragedy and they want to put the blame on uh, Zweardists. Even Moscow television in the news. But with Shevardnadze in power in Georgia, accessions are suddenly finding Russia and Georgia ganging up against them. Georgians insist uh, that uh, the men who surround the town, they are not uh, from the National Guard of Hedrioni, but Zweardists. We want to know it for sure. Who is it? Georgia and Russia are confusing the accessions with disinformation. Moscow Television is repeating Mr. Shevardnadze's line that the war in Ossetia is conducted not by his forces, but by Zviadists, loyal to the exiled president. But with cameras on both sides, we could understand the Ossetian's confusion, faced by tanks and armored vehicles, which Mr. Gamsahurdia had never had. If those who are killing our people every day, if they are 
from the National Guard, then how can they speak about peace? Edward Chevarnadze's arrival had been welcomed among Ossetians who saw him as more pro-Russian. But in tandem with talk of peace, an offensive was launched against Ossetia, driving its undergun fighters into the outskirts of their own capital city. This is our land. They want to split it from us and join Russia. What is that? Are there gamma security forces in this area? Maybe there are. Rocket landed in a house a few yards off. As we cleaned up with the Georgians, our second camera on the accession side asked the fighters there about the mystery of Edward Chevardnadze. Camp Sikorty was mentally ill, so the Ossetian people were not afraid of him. But Chevardnadze, he is a sly one. No wonder they call him an old fox. Under the mask of a Democrat, there is a predator hiding. He is the one who is really dangerous. We thought things would change with the arrival of Shevard Nazi. We thought the blockade would be lifted. But instead, things got worse. When Gamsakordi was in power, there were no tanks attacking. But now, with the arrival of Shevard Nazi, they're here. They are shooting at people, and we have casualties every day. The plight of the accessions received sympathy from all over Russia. An agreement was signed, which brought in Russian peacekeeping forces. The communist status quo in the area was restored, and Mr. Shevardnadze received Russian and international acclaim. It is the right of a nation to choose whom they want to join and who is going to be their partner. If this is not respected, I think the politics of madness will prevail and more innocent blood will be spilled. But the price paid in blood was high. The Georgians started shooting at our bus. My mother was killed. She covered me and the bullet hit her in the back. There was a boy named Ninjad. He stayed there. We couldn't escape. Our motor didn't work. But the ceasefire in Ossetia remains tense and unstable, and within weeks, a new and more dangerous war began. Georgia now is uncontrolled. And even Caucasus is uncontrolled. And Shevardnadze has no control. No control. Shevardnadze is in Shevardnadze's state now. Thieves and robbers are ruling the country. How can he control so, so many robbers, so many thieves? The war in Abkhazia pits Muslim against Christian and threatens to spread throughout the Caucasus. But it began as a punitive operation against supporters of the deposed president, Gamsa Hurdia. Protected by the autonomy of the Abkhazian enclave, open protest against Mr. Shevardnadze's regime lasted longer here than anywhere else. In August, Zviadis fighters took a Shevardnadze minister prisoner. 3,000 Pedrioni and National Guards supported by tanks set out to free him. The Abkhazians were seeking their own independence. They had nothing to do with the incident. But finding themselves invaded, they responded, and a full-scale war began. They must back down, otherwise we will make them. But how? By force. In the midst of the war, Mr. Shevardnadze stood for election. We asked him what had turned a communist into a democrat. Don't ask me. I am delicately suggesting that you don't ask me such naive questions. My people believe in me. 
Just take a look how much support the present leadership has, including Shevardnadze. Mr. Shevardnadze won 92% of the vote. He was the only candidate. All 47 parties supported him. And the biggest victor in the parliamentary elections was the Peace Bloc, made up mainly of former communists voted out two years before.